I started listening to Power Versus Force. It's an interesting book. It's so far outside of anything else that I've ever read. So it's <laughs> it's good. I mean, I love it though because I think just transforming my mind and being exposed to new stuff and listening to more is positive. And I'm trying to. It's been a very intellectually confusing month between AI and the coffee thing. <laughs> it's just been like. <laughs> What is going on? <laughs> so what, what with AI? What was confusing with AI? Not confusing, just kind of like blown away at like, I, I mean, I know it was coming down the pipeline. I just didn't realize, I mean, back in December going through it and kind of just not really thinking through the scope of it so much, I guess. And just being like, oh, wow, this really will change the world. Like radically starting now <laughs> like, yeah. oh and we're on yeah <laughs> yeah it's, exactly. it's funny actually because i was having a conversation with the woman who used to be the head of cognitive neuroscience for darpa last week and we're on the we're on the board of a company together actually she's the chief investment officer i'm just on the board and she was talking to one of her colleagues who's working with the chat gpt4 not the three but the four yeah. and said that the four is live and it is, I mean, it's obviously on a closed network, but it's so far beyond three that it makes three look silly and like it's standing still. Which I know. Is frightening. It's frightening. I know because like, that's the thing. Like I was telling people, I was like, this is the most stupid version of AI. This is like the IQ two version. it's like not even close to what it's going to be and the ramifications. And I think it's just, I don't know, because I'm I, I'm just kind of wondering wondering how it's going to affect capitalism. I, I'm a little bit worried that it'll have more inequality in terms of like people who control the AI or are good at it have they have the upper hand in all of it. And so I, I, I don't know. What, what do you what do you think is going to happen with all that in terms of like capitalism or just our current economic state? <clears throat> well, you know, it, I think it really kind of depends on what ends up being the blend between, you know, the AI and the way it's used. Right now, we're, I mean, we're still not at general artificial intelligence. And as soon as we have, you know, general artificial intelligence, that's entirely a new thing. You know, that's the, the singularity and kind of a, the point at which computers become faster than us in all regards and sharper and more aware. And at the rate we're going, it's coming and coming quickly, <laughs> you know, which is, which is a little frightening, but as long as there's a human component to it, I think you're exactly right that it will definitely sway the balance of power towards the people who are adept at handling AI. Because really, the system of governance has always been the same in the world. Basically, it's mercantile feudalism. It hasn't really changed for you know the better part of 10,000 years. The people who control the resources and the flow of those resources and social labor pretty much control the world. You know, democracy was was a, uh, you know, a democratic republic that we had here. It was kind of a failed experiment because it, it didn't really stand the test of time. Basically, it it became kind of corrupted in the same way that everything else had happened. You know, it's gotten back to the point where, if, I mean, if you look at the pharmaceutical industry that we both play with all the time, you realize that it's remarkably different than anything we would have expected, right? It's basically the people with the wealth are able to manipulate the systems. I mean, for anybody who thinks that seems kind of tinfoil hat, simply go back and read through the documents for the approval of aspartame. That'll clear it all up, you know? Yeah. I think it might've been Yale or something did a study on just like, what is our government? And they concluded it was like an oligarchy or something. I, it could be, I know they concluded it was an oligarchy and it was like a pretty prestigious school and I forget which one. I didn't read it. So that was just the headline. So <laughs> maybe don't take my word for that, but yeah, it's interesting. And like uh, on the subject of AI, I think, yeah, you just have to adapt because like I have, I have been so tight on time. I, I need to spend more time working with it because I see the importance of that. Like for me, thinking back to like middle school and learning computers and learning social media and learning, and I'm not good at it, but I spent a lot of time becoming very native to all these things. And I think I need to become native with AI in terms of like intuitive intuitiveness, knowing how to use it. And with my employees, as soon as I kind of understood the concept or my concept of it, of AI and what it means, I was like, you know, 
you can be scared of this or we can all just like improve our efficiency by using it. So it's not going to replace, or, like we're a small enough company where we're not a corporation. They're like, oh, we can wipe out 2000 employees. Great. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, we have like uh, 11, 12 people on the core team and then like another 20 contractors. So my perspective was like, just le learn it and use it to become better at what you do. Because it's really Right. I do think the people, as I said, that are in control of it and the people who take the time to learn it, like any new technology, right? If you embrace a new technology, you'll generally do well. That's why, you know, Sam Walton, one of the first big expenses that he uh, kind of paid out was uh, to get uh, logistics handled and computerized. And so when he saw it coming that computers were going to be really kind of the forefront of the future, he dumped a ton of money and resources at getting everything set up so all of the corporate logistics for his stores were taken care of on computers. And obviously that was a good idea. You know, I mean, it, yeah. you can look at Amazon and say they kind of did the same thing with the next iterative version of that where they got on, on the web and they really did the same thing. At first, we'll send books because they're difficult to damage. They're all about the same size. You know, we'll handle the logistics, get everything in place, and then we'll open up. It's a good strategy. I mean, if you adopt a strategy of utilizing whatever new technology it is, and I think actually you can be sort of ambivalent about what the new technology is. There's always a new technology, you know, always, literally. Yeah. You know, Age bronze age. What I mean, there's there's always something like I have there's a a comedy duo in the UK called Mitchell and Webb, and they have an entire thing about you know the, the adoption of bronze, you know, and, and the people who were, you know, the chippers for stone prior to that being very upset that they were gonna get supplanted by these guys who are starting to use bronze. And how does this work? And Learn how to use bronze. Yeah. We either adapt or you know, we kind of go the way of the dodo. Yeah. I mean, that's the mentality you have to have is like, how can I utilize this to, to, uh, my benefit? I don't want to say that in like a narcissistic way, but just like, uh, how can you improve where you're at using the tools that you have access to? And I actually just had a little bit ago, there's this guy I'm talking to Paniz and I'm actually funding a little bit of this startup that he's working on. He's a researcher at ASU in metabolomics. So he does systems biology stuff, but it's really interesting because he uses mass spec to, uh, he, he can measure 68% of the metabolism, he says, based on in each, you know, there's like 25,000 metabolites in the, in the blood. And so he selects two strategic metabolites in each pathway. And based on that, he gets a 68% measurement of the metabolism. And then when you weight in the factors of like, what are the biggest causes of all cause mortality, like mm -hmm. cancer, things like that. He can look at like over 90% of, you know, basically make a diagnostic on a disease and over 90% of what we're facing with tremendous accuracy. And then where these intersect is we were talking about what would that look like to put AI on all that data? It'd be really interesting. Yeah. I think like there's some amazing things you can do. Yeah. If you humans suck at multivariate systems analysis, we are just not really tooled for it. Right. We are not done. We're we're really not built terribly well for parallel processing like that. And yeah, AI is just remarkable. I think if if you can utilize those systems and leverage it, the the obvious, you know, diamonds that are kind of hidden in the rough there, people will start to find new things. I have no doubt that there are a tremendous amount of biological processes that we've already adopted and and are in textbooks everywhere that, you know, we say it functions like this. When in fact, it, more likely than not, we're very, very, very wrong. It's just a matter of we haven't been able to process enough data and synthesize a, a clear enough result just because of the way we're structured. And I think AI will actually change that. You know, mach machine learning just in general, uh, you know, there's a reason all of the financial, financial institutions in the world use it because it can sift through data and see patterns that we do not see. We just don't have the capacity to see it. And a lot of times, I know in the financial sector, my dad was an anthropologist and archaeologist, and we had discussed some of the uh, the machine learning programs that were going out in the financial sector a while back. And he was he was kind of impressed with some of it because it had been sorting through patterns and seeing things where there were correlations that were so subtle. They were definitive correlations, but they were so subtle that you wouldn't have thought it. And the obviousness of those kind of eluded people, like, you know, some of them make sense, you know, like a, a slight tweak in the natural gas market changed the housing market because it upregulated the cost 
of drywall because that's what they use to dry the actual gypsum as it's being processed and little bitty things like that that you know when you you don't see it on the surface but if you look at the secondary and the tertiary and the quaternary steps you kind of go like oh wow so all we have to do is track this one thing and it'll give us a predictable outcome here and when you can kind of step it up with AI or machine learning and do really accurate predictive modeling in metabolomics. I mean, if you look at just that and you start to go, wow, wait a second. So if I simply tweak the oxidative stress buffers on the surface of mitochondria, that cascades up in 15 different arenas, you know, and, and a lot of the things that I've done, luckily, I kind of noticed that, you know, shift in, in mitochondrial tweaking early on, but, and you can enhance cellular output if you just simply shift the oxidative stress buffers on the surface of the mitochondrial membrane. You know, in fact, my my first patent in the biospace, well, actually my second patent in the biospace was cellular enhancements in biological systems through the use of lipofluorine peptide combinations. And basically, that wow. was the way of saying that I had, I had realized that if I took <clears throat> nanospheres and bound them to a lipid, I could get them to pass through the cell membrane. And then the the lipid would delocalize from the nanosphere. The nanosphere, because of a, a charge gradient differential, would pull itself to the surface of the mitochondria, where it would act as an oxidative stress buffer. And if you coupled that function with the inclusion of a few different peptide chains, you could get these really bizarrely outsized results. You know, I know that the, the Kvensin protocol from Russia is one of the things that I kind of leveraged to do that. But you start seeing these little bitty things that have these outsized effects. And I, and I think machine learning, AGI, all that stuff, it's, it's really, it's going to make a pr profound difference. But like you said, we have to adopt it. You know, if we just put our head in the sand and try and take the ostrich approach to technological progression, we're not going to go, it's not going to go so it, well for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not like other people care that you're ignoring it. They're going to figure out how to use it. Yeah. And it, it well... We're, we're getting really fast into here. So to edify you a little bit, and I know you're a humble guy, so you won't like this to a degree, but uh, <laughs> like, uh, I don't think I've ever used the word genius to describe a person until I met you and understood. And I'm sure you have access to um, a lot of people that I have never met. But uh, in my mind, it, it just really in, uh, intelligent person, very humble, kind, like you have all the traits of, I think that just give you this ability to make impact in so many different spaces. But what are like the different industries that you would say that you've had an impact in that feels to you significant? Ooh, let's see. Well, definitely biology, biochemistry, some pretty profound things in, you know, physics, but solid state chemistry and you know i've been working on some condensed matter physics things that are really kind of different and sort of revolutionary that aren't out yet around superconductivity and leveraging things like the meisner principle and some other things yes the meisner principle <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a principle for exclusion of magnetic fields through superconductors so you can do these kind of interesting things where you quantum lock something and you you actually in this case you take the field of force lines called fluxons from that are em emitted from magnetic fields kind of if you looked at a little bar magnet and you saw the iron filings rolling around it those are actually kind of gross representations of the actual billions of fluxons that are right there and you can do these kind of interesting things if you start to leverage type 2 superconductors which are not superconductive at one level, but are superconductive when they drop below a threshold temperature. And you can actually tangibly lock the, the field of force lines, kind of like the bristles on the brush. You know, they just poke up in one direction. And it makes them incredibly strong at things like, you know, holding objects up or in a specific state or pushing things for repulsion. And so it's just... it. it I'm just playing with a lot of things that are different construction stuff, you know, like around concrete and things like that made some pretty good strides in making a carbon negative concrete, which was which was pretty good. And I'm still hoping that it, it gets adoption at some point. There's some there's some hurdles there, though. And, you know, like anything else, I kind of outlined about a decade ago, the, the big problems that I thought I could contribute towards and it was just six things that i wrote on on the whiteboard in my in my lab when i first opened it and everything that i've been doing even though they seem really kind of random and you know like add squirrel like i'm looking off off at things all the time 
they're all moving with a specific direction. And it's just things that I thought I could kind of try and create some sort of insight for benefit towards and use that to leverage to leverage things for the positive, you know, just basically, where can I use my own talents to try and help humanity, which sounds, you know, it sounds kind of Pollyanna, but it, but it's really true, because I think if everybody took that approach, and I'm sort of taking the the whole, you know, the, be the change that you want to see in the world kind of approach, I wish everybody were just trying to leverage it and weren't quite so focused on the, you know, like the sort of the animalistic instinct of, you know, like, I'm going to get what I can right now because the resources are scarce. I don't actually think Thomas Malthus nailed it. I think Malthusian dynamics are a bit off. And I think the he neglected to realize that uh, resources aren't really finite. They're only finite um, if you aren't paying attention to the game and you're locked in a certain paradigm. You know, the guys who are whale oil sure finite resource but petroleum you know and petroleum finite resource but electric vehicles you know it's kind of like if if you get trapped in your own paradigm you don't you have difficulty seeing your way out so i'm kind of trying to just take the skill sets that i have across those different fields of chemistry biochemistry physics quantum physics you know material science whatever and just well, nudge things forward where i can and i'm probably just too too curious i think if you have horrible ADD and you're not bright, they they tell you you have ADD. If you're you know reasonably bright and you have ADD, they call you a polymath. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so you just diagnose that as ADD. Fair enough. So what are the uh, six things that you wrote down on the board? And I love that you say like, hey, my life's mission is to do things that progress humanity. But then you kind of break those down into six categories. What are those? So aging was the first, then cancer, clean water, global warming, free energy, and superluminal travel, which is just faster than light travel. And I've and I've actually, I mean, honestly, I've made some pretty good strides on all of those. Um, aging, I still think I hold the record for longest extension in a mammalian lifespan. I had my lab animals lived ninety three percent longer than they were supposed to. I did a an experiment where I made a substance kind of in the base was a lipofluorine, so a, a fat bound to carbon 60, and then some other components added into it. And I used P53 knockout mice, which were, in oncology, you get these types of mice that have the tumor suppressor gene, the P53 gene extracted, and then they're bred. And so I used the ones that were the most damaged, which is a homozygous knockout knockout. So it's a negative negative. Uh, which just basically means that they are going to die very rapidly. But because in oncology, we use those a lot, they have an insanely well-defined mortality curves. Like, you know, within a couple of weeks when your animals are going to die. And so I, you know, did this entire experiment with it. And at the end of the day, the average was a 93% extension in lifespan, which was kind of remarkable. There were some guys that I had patterned this after in Paris, a fellow named Fati Musa, who had done the research. And, and to be frank, I, I didn't believe it. I thought it was just, it was such a pronounced result when he did an experiment that was very similar. He did it and got a 90% extension on lifespan. And I thought, yeah, that's not believable. But I'm, you know, I'm pretty open-minded. And at the time I thought, well, you know, I'll run this down and see. And so I, I did the experiment and sure enough, you know, his was 93 or his was 90, mine was 93. And that's, that's too tight a variance to just be random. You right. Know, you know, and now- And too extreme. Yeah, I'm I'm a decade into the research on all that stuff. I've seen things that really kind of blew my mind that I, I was not expecting. Like the idea of, you know, has the person been born that could live to be 150? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. No question about it. I don't even, I, that's, that was something that I answered to my own satisfaction probably five years ago. Now the, the question is like, well, certainly we can double the lifespan, right? If you get a 93% lifespan on a human, that, that equates to basically 152 years based on the average of the male-female given lifespans between like 79 and 81 right now. So yeah, that's easy. But that was stuff I did, you know, five to seven years ago. Now I'm thinking, and this sounds like a, you know, sort of hyperbolic statement, but I think easily 200, 300% extension in normal lifespan is very doable. You know, ironically, and I, I was citing this yesterday, I was speaking to some people about old Ayurveda things, which are, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Vedas or the, the old Hindu text that had, you know, lots of knowledge that was passed down. And 
in Ayurveda, there was a ritual called an Agni ritual. Agni was the god of fire. And you would do this thing where you would have a lingam, which basically looks like an egg. It's a Shiva lingam. And you would burn charcoal from coconut husks, very, very fine charcoal. And then you would pour ghee, which is clarified butter, right? So butyric acid. So you pour that over it and then what forms at the bottom is kind of this paste that gets mixed up over over the time of the ritual and then you would ingest it right so you're ingesting a pretty chunky amount actually for the back of the day of lipoborines and what was said is if you took the prasad which is kind of the the re remnants of that i'd say an experiment they would say a ritual a puja but if you took the uh, if you took the resultant kind of compounds that were left over at the bottom of that which was the the holy food the prasad and ingested it, it was said that you'd live two cycles, which was basically 200 years or thereabouts. And, you know, kind of, I remember seeing that and thinking, wow, that's obviously pretty accurate based on the data that I'm seeing with my lab animals. If you did that exact thing, you'd, you'd get this really pronounced extension and lifespan, but it's, it was obviously lost in antiquity and people thought that it was just some, you know, like statement that was ludicrous and, you know, religious kind of craziness, but but actually, the biology backs it up. And, uh, you know, I, I think there are a lot of things like that where uh, things have perhaps been lost in antiquity and we're not quite as far along as we think we are. W what that was, for me, that was the, the aging. I thought, wow, okay, that's a big stride. And also, since the P53 knockout mice are the mice that you use in oncology because they develop idiopathic tumors, right, which is just the medical way of saying it's it's spontaneous origin, kind of of origin unknown, then they just crop up all over the body. So that led me to number two, which was cancer, because they didn't die of tumors, which was very, very bizarre. So the the first the first rodent that died, I I did the necropsy myself and I opened it up and looked through everything and I thought, what obviously died of a femoral hemorrhage. This makes no sense. You know, it should have had tumors everywhere and there were no tumors because its lifespan was already very, very, very enhanced in comparison to where it should have been. So I thought, well, you know, I'm not a vet pathologist. I don't do histology, so that's not my daily gig. I'm going to send this off to somebody who actually knows what the hell they're doing. So the next couple of animals that died, I sent them off to a veterinary pathologist to do full histological workups and everything. And I kept getting the same data sets back, you know, like on one of them, I think there was a small tumor, but none of the others really had tumors to speak of. One was inconclusive, but they kept doing this thing where like the reason they're bred that way is so that they die of tumors. They didn't die of tumors and they lived, you know, 93% longer. So I thought, aha, checkbox two, you know, cancer. And then that kind of led me down a berry path to work on, on a lot of oncological things. And then clean water is kind of interesting. That actually... There's a couple of ways you can break that down on my my list of things to make an impact. I actually think that water as a whole right now, the, one of the bigger issues that's kind of going under the radar that people aren't paying attention to is deuterium. And I know you're familiar mm. with it, but yeah. deuterium is basically heavy hydrogen. So normally when you talk about hydrogen, you're talking about a proton with one orbital electron. Heavy hydrogen is a proton, a neutron, and an orbital electron. And the thing that's kind of insidious about it is it basically just goes anywhere hydrogen goes, which, as you know, is water. And since water, by molecular count, makes up a little over 99% of our entire physical form, uh, it's kind of a big deal if those ratios get off. And basically, our biology for billions of years, you know, from primordial soup up, we kind of evolved with a very specific ratio of deuterium concentrations. And over the past 60 years, it's skewed pretty massively. Uh, it's gone from about 130-ish parts per million to about 155 parts per million. And so what that really means is the impact, our mitochondria are set up to actually process the water and do it in such a way that they we ingest water, then it actually goes into our mitochondria, gets broken down, reconfigured, and set up in a way that we're biologically able to utilize it. But when you have deuterium in there, it's kind of heavy comparatively. So, you know, it's twice the mass of normal hydrogen. So it slows down the mitochondrial processes and you end up in an energy deficit. And it's kind of almost like the atmosphere. You know, our bodies evolved at 21% oxygen, but right now in the atmosphere, we've got 19% oxygen. So really like every day when you're awake, when you're sleeping, when you're driving, when you're doing everything, you're running at about a 10% deficit in terms of the overall efficiency of your mitochondria simply just because of water. 
then you're running at a 10% deficit because of your oxygen consumption. I mean, if you look at the rates of respiration a century ago versus now, our, our respiratory rate has gone up remarkably. Like we have to breathe so much more to be able to move. And that's because there's less oxygen available for us in the atmosphere. And so our, our respiratory rates have cycled up. So it's basically, it's just humanity. Unfortunately, we find ourselves at a bit of a deficit across a lot of fields. So that led from, you know, the oncology to the clean water and the global warming, because you got to take care of the atmosphere. And, and frankly, I'm not as big on the, on the global warming thing. I think <clears throat> carbon dioxide, though it's something to be addressed, it's not really my focal point. I, I think the, the things that are real booger bears are methane, you know, hydrogen sulfide. I mean, there's nitrogen dioxide. There's a lot of, there's a lot of things in the atmosphere that are byproducts of the same industries that are cranking out carbon dioxide that are really far more damaging and far more detrimental with a lot more kind of scary long-term consequences. So I really, though I don't beat the drum about global warming, you know, I don't, I don't say, you know, you shouldn't focus on this. Fine, focus on the CO2 because the, just the secondary effect of people worrying about that is that they'll reduce the things that I actually consider to be really damaging. You know, actually carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is 95.47% of all of it uh, you know, in terms of greenhouse gases in the world is water vapor that's naturally occurring. So d though we can modulate things a little bit, and it is this kind of giant homeostatic planet, um, if we want to get some real high leverage stuff, I think we might actually be looking in perhaps the wrong place, but that's okay. I'd rather people are, are you know, doing things close and making a dent and trying to be helpful than, than not. Uh, and then <laughs> next would would on the list was free energy and you know and there's there's a lot of people that that have basically said oh you know free energy violates the second law of thermodynamics and i'm not really saying free energy in the sense of violation of the second law of thermodynamics i have been able to figure out a couple of systems that um that that certainly don't violate anything and they have they have a definitive endpoint you know but if you can get a system to run for the next 10 to fifteen thousand years without any issues and provide, you know, a positive power feed, that's pretty good, you know. Yeah. And <laughs> that's not that. bad. I mean, I mean it's, it's okay. It's free energy, you know, but I mean, in the sense of the way we get it, you know, just deriving things from the sun, that's pretty free. You know, pretty much everything we get is just kind of like a, a slave drive to the sun. And one of the things that I've been working on is a, is a resonant drive system, which basically the idea is that resonant harmonics are kind of interesting because, if you look at the way things vibrate, if you have a tuning fork over here and a similarly tuned tuning fork here, and you hit this one, then this one will start to vibrate without you know any real perceivable loss in the energetics of the things. And it's because of sympathetic harmonic resonance. And there's, there's really, there's an overabundance of energy in the world. We just don't know how to tap it. And so one of the things that I've been tinkering with as of late, it's just a couple of ways to tap that and basically use the, the resonant frequencies of the planet to actually provide motive force. And then the motive force translates into electrical energy, which kind of seems to be the primary energy currency of the day. So that's, that's a good one. And then the last one is just superluminal travel. And I have definitively not cracked that egg. So I've gotten actually, I built a thing called an M drive, which gets us close, but it, it, it doesn't hit my goal. Then yeah. and to be honest, I, I built it and we tested it and we got really great data sets and it worked. And then I disassembled it and separated all of the parts because I realized that there was a real p potential for misuse. So, you know, I'm trying not to be the idiot scientist, you know, who, who does something that, that has the potential for great benefit, but also has the potential for great harm in a world where the sort of the, I guess the, the, foot race between ethics and technology ethics is greatly unfortunately outpaced by technology and, yeah. and you know and i i don't want to be somebody who contributes and a la you know alfred nobel spend the remainder Man. of my days you know trying yeah. to use the vast fortune that i've made to fund something so nobody remembers that i made my made my wealth by blowing things up but you know rather the prize that i've set up for you know advancing science and humanity so <laughs> I just, I, feel, I honestly, I feel bad for Alfred Nobel. I, I just don't want to go down that very path. I just couldn't imagine like a worst case scenario is something that you bring into the world to be good, just like wreaks massive harm. Like that would be just so crushing, I think.
Yeah, actually, I I agree. I I think it really would be. You know, there's a there there are a couple of people that are scientists out there that I've seen their their research, and some of it's just brilliant. And I really I look at it and go like, oh, that's that's the right way. They're doing it the right way. They're very tapped in. There's a fellow that works with the Department of the Navy named Salvatore Pai. And I've looked at a lot of his work and I look at it and go, wow, somebody got it. That's right. That's like, that's exactly how you do that thing. And some of the, you know, one is superconductivity. One is like con con condensed fusion reactions or confined fusion reactions. It, like some really kind of heady stuff that's out there, but the guy's doing it the right way. But it scares the hell out of me that he's working for the Department of the Navy, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> like the Defense Department. Well, yeah, I mean, I've worked with those guys before, but like, is it really defense or is it really more offense? Because yeah. <laughs> you, you got to look at the numbers of that and go, do you really spend, you know, the resources of the next 28 countries <laughs> in the world for pure defense? No. Yeah, we're not known to be non-invasive. You know, we're a pretty invasive country. <laughs> so it's like, huh, yeah, this military complex, it seems to be going in a good direction. I don't think so. But <laughs> yeah, we, we, what was it? We talked like, uh, I think our second time talking, you were telling me about some like heat shield you had produced and like, uh, I'm exaggerating, but it was like 4 million degrees Celsius on one side. And then it was room temperature on the other and it's moldable and all this stuff. And I remember saying like, oh, so you could use that for like houses. And then I thought about it later. I was like, Man, I just, if that gives them any, sig that gives them a good signal of how little I know about the stuff. Because I was like, that applies to like everything. <laughs> like right, heat Mike, shielding is huge. <laughs> you but, can use it for a lot of other, other things. But legitimately, that was one of the things that was going to be kind of a, a big thing there is I had a, a friend who moved to Colorado last year. And right after he moved, all those wildfires hit and his neighborhood, he's a he's a doctor and he works with prescription Scott. And he sent me a picture of his neighborhood and all of the houses were just decimated. I mean, decimated. Mm -hmm. And with something like this, just, you know, a, like a moldable, paintable intimescent, you could easily put it on the outside of a house and block it from, you know, the, the same effects. You know, it because it only activates when it is under fire. So otherwise, it's just kind of sitting there and not really doing anything. And then when it's needed, it, you know, molecularly activates and, and creates a really good buffer. I'll actually, I'll send you a video. A friend of mine, Luke Story, had come up to my lab. A I saw of, that video. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, I know Luke too. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that was nuts. You had the egg with the moldable heat shield around it and the... Egg was not cracking under that torch. Did it end up cracking at all? I didn't. Uh, I don't know yeah, if I well, watched the whole thing. Cracked, cracked it open, and then when the yolk comes out, the yolk is still uncooked, and that's kind of like the ta -da! yeah. Is, you know, it's it. I, the very first time I did that experiment, I'll send you. I'll send you a video of me doing that. The very first time we did it, because I just cracked up. I couldn't do anything but laugh because it was so <laughs> ludicrous to me that I was hitting it at you know three thousand seven hundred and thirty degrees with a blowtorch, and then. The yoke was, was fine when Unfazed. I opened it. Yeah, it was it was pretty legit because the surface of it becomes effectively molten. You know, I mean, if you're looking at it, it is glowing orange, like the filament of a light bulb or something. And then, and then to just kind of peel back the little thin one millimeter layer and crack it open, and the egg comes out uncooked. It was it's pretty cool. I just thought it was ludicrous when I first did it. I I cracked up laughing. And then the then of course the next experiment was I covered a solo cup, you know, just a little plastic solo cup with the same thing and then hit it with a blowtorch. And when we took everything off, you could still see everything was fine and it had the little solo, which I thought was Jeez. great. It's for yeah. if you're doing a picnic at a volcano, that's probably that's really <laughs> that's uh, that's what the <laughs> the cloth is going to be made of. <laughs> between yeah. somebody who can develop really cool products and really know where to use them it's great volcanic proof solo cups huge market yeah so. <laughs> that's perfect yeah but it kind of le led me to like this this these juices you sent me i don't know what you call them but <laughs> the supplements <laughs> i i'm happy to call them ions i should say laboratory juices because if i just say ions juices that sounds weird <laughs> but <laughs> yeah that seems very yeah i would have some misgivings about that <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it's the wizard sciences stuff. And I don't know, it's always hard to like identify, wow, I had a huge uptick. Um, when I did take these though, I have been noticing, like I was putting together a slide set for, we're doing a training on ozone therapy. So the, the challenge is always to, hey, here's what's going on. It, making like good usable condensed information that's easy to understand is, and it's interesting you know, and is something, you know, maybe a little bit unique, ideally, and uh, all those different elements into it. And everything was just clicking together. And then I was like, what's in this? Uh, we, we won't call it, we'll, we'll just call it the wizard sciences. We'll go with that. So uh, can you tell me about the C60 stuff that you sent me? Yeah, sure. So I, well, actually, yes, here, you were probably getting this one, which is like, you know, I start my day with this stuff. I, I do two two of them primarily which are just the olympic for physical things and then the neural for mental things and so the neural that was actually designed for people with alzheimer's right that was my sole intent for making that serum was to take someone with alzheimer's and fix them you know like how do you fix them so when i did that it was about a three week long process i took a week and figured out kind of my like pathophysiology of like what what's the origin of this right like how does this disease work and at the end of a week i thought damn, it's not a disease. It's a protective mechanism that's just run too long. And so when I kind of came up with that as my hypothesis, I thought, okay, well, if that's the hypothesis I'm going to run with, then how do I deal with all of the different components of that? So the first was to take a lipofullerene because it, it does some kind of interesting things when it hits your brain, but I needed to configure it in such a way that it would get to the brain. So I figured, ah, I'll let the body do the heavy lifting. So I bound the fullerene to caprylic acid, which is just the, the C8, like Bulletproof Brain Octane or, you know, a bunch of the other companies. They just, it's one specific fraction of a medium chain triglyceride. And the reason you use that is it goes to your liver, breaks down into beta hydroxybutyrate, and then gets cycled through your brain as ketone bodies. And you can use it there as fuel. And that's why, that's actually why there have been a lot of benefits to people eating medium chain triglycerides or consuming coconut oil that had Alzheimer's is because your brain, when you're not able to glycolytically function and process energy through glycolysis, which is kind of the, the first battery, the brain has a secondary backup system, which is to, to be able to run on ketones. So if you can get people ketones and their brain isn't capable of functioning, I'm sure you've heard people talk about Alzheimer's like diabetes type three. Well, the, the idea is that you can't, function just pulling things from sugars the way you normally would glycolytically. So you shift over to ketone bodies and your brain uses energy from those. So I thought, okay, I'll bind this nanosphere to this lipid and then I'll get it to hit the liver, translocate to the brain, and then I can sort of douse the neurons with these. And the, the rationale for that is when you can get those particles in the neurons, you actually trigger a production of new neurons. So neurogenesis sparks up but not at the normal rate. So your body has these two compounds, BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and NGF1, which is neural growth factor one. And those are what kind of regulate the pace of neurogenesis in your body. And this outpaces those by a factor of two, two or three to one. So, you know, you're either double or triple the rate. And then the morphology, just the structure of the neurons is different. So from the central neuronal body, the, the axonal span that goes out, kind of the little spindly legs that come off of a neuron are usually two to three times longer. So it creates these very large neurons that are capable of patching around different areas. So when your brain fires, you can fire either electrically, chemically, or electrochemically, right, to potentiate the neuronal flow, right? It's all... Basically, it all functions by a thing called voltage-gated calcium ion channel flow. So you're, you're opening different gates and compounds are moving across. So if you want to think of it like a spark gap, you've got a certain gap and you're trying to get information to jump via a spark across them. And if you can upregulate the energy and have a longer span, then you have a higher likelihood of being able to get the information from where it's stored to where you want it to go, right? And if you are like any other creature, as you age the amount of available energy drops. So this has the added benefit of upregulating neurogenesis, downregulating neural inflammatory response. It, it actually shunts a thing called cytokines. And cytokines are kind of like the body's inflammatory markers. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure you know that from, you know, like ozone. Ozone does the same thing, right? It creates this pro-inflammatory insult that isn't really as damaging as the body kind of thinks it is. And so the, the secondary effect of that is your mitochondria upregulate 
release a bunch of antioxidants, glutathione goes up, SOD2 goes up, and then you get all these beneficial factors just from kind of nudging it, right? Because all the ozone is reacting. It's the third most reactive molecular species. All that stuff's gone in a, in a couple of seconds, but you end up with all these beneficial effects because your body has responded in a certain programmatic way. Well, this is very similar in that you, you upregulate mitochondrial function, you get more capacity in your neurons, so you have more power to jump the spark gap, if you will, and get the signal across. So you decrease inflammation, you upregulate energy potentiation, and then I put proteolytic enzymes in there because one of the other big things that, that I kind of in my hypothesis of how that disease was progressing, and, and sadly at the end of it, I thought, damn, it's, it's not just for people with Alzheimer's, this is happening to everyone all the time is anytime we either have an endogenous or exogenous threat, whether it's in a P. gingivalis in your mouth or glyphosate in the food or mercury in the fish, whatever, anything that's coming into our brain that our body registers as, as some sort of threat, it's going to sequester it and, and kind of wrap it in, say, tau proteins or beta amyloid plaques and just pack it away. Now, in the short term, that's not a big deal because you've got this thing called the glymphatic system, which is sort of a subset of your lymphatic system that opens while you're sleeping and it uses interstitial fluid and cerebrospinal fluid to literally wash your brain. And in accord with aging, the older you get, the less power you have. So kind of like the, the pressure, the water pressure and the fire hose that you're trying to use to clean the sidewalk drops and drops and drops the older you get. And the size of the, you know, bits of gum and proteins and plaques that are all stuck on the sidewalk start to get larger and larger and larger because they're building up over time. So you've got a down regulation of your body's capacity to deal with it and an up regulation over time of the literal size of these problems, these plaques. So I put proteolytic enzymes in there so that they would perfuse past the blood brain barrier. And it was a, based on some Japanese research that had shown kind of the, uh, the sizing of those particles and their ability to make it past the blood brain barrier. And so to that end, these proteolytic enzymes go in and they start to break down the, the clumping of the proteins and the plaques. And so at night, when your glymphatic system triggers on, it takes out little particles instead of trying to just chip away at huge masses that it can't move. And so every day that you do this, you start to remove all of that plaque and then you start to fire more effectively, right? So neuronal potentiation goes up. And also your lymphatic system, just as a, as a byproduct of kind of helping the mitochondria, all of those systems get a little bit more juice. And so your lymphatic system actually starts to function more effectively. So you go from a negative feedback loop to a positive feedback loop. And then I put in a couple of other things like NMN and resveratrol, because when you, when you get the C60 to hit the neurons and actually stick in the, in the mitochondria in those guys, you get more ATP output. But that's just because you're blocking oxidative stress load. If you want to really amp it up, well, then you take NAD precursors like nicotinamide mononucleotide. And I couple it with resveratrol because it kind of gives it a big bump. You couple those things together and you get those in. And then you're actually not just blocking system loss but you're adding power. So you end up with a much more robust energy cycle in your neurons. And then I added in a thing called pyroloquinoline quinone, which is just PQQ. And it, that stimulates mitochondrial biogenesis. So my thought there was, as things get healthier, I want to have more mitochondria in those cells since they're already losing power. So I want to have basically more power plants to power the neurons. And so ultimately, you end up with a reduction in inflammation, you end up with better energy potentiation, higher number of neurons, if, if you actually make them stick. And it, it's kind of a, a brain remodeling program. It wasn't, a lot of people use it as a nootropic, because as you noticed, that upregulation of the energy, things fire in ways that they hadn't previously, they just make the connections more effectively. But yeah. if you're in a state of cognitive decline or really advanced, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia or something, it's a lifesaver. And that's what it was intended to be. But if you don't have any real huge cognitive deficit, what you notice because of the upregulation of the, the energy is just kind of that your, your brain is on fire and you can do all sorts of things that you don't. And actually, to me, the coolest part of this, a lot of people just take it for kind of the short term bump. But the coolest part is that after about three weeks of ingesting that, 
you really end up with enough of it that you're you're triggering neurogenesis. And so you're starting to get this outcropping of new neurite outgrowth. And but but your body is very brilliant, right? The, the human system, like if anybody who pays attention and works in this field, if you literally are not in awe of how this whole thing works, you're not doing it right. Like it is a <laughs> brilliant system. And yeah. so the thing that's kind of cool to me is that you, your body's always looking for the optimal homeostasis, right? So it wants a perfect balance. Well, neurons, unfortunately, are, are tremendously resource consumptive. They weigh, you know, like your brain weighs two and a half to three percent of your body mass, but sucks in between 20 and 25 percent of all of your oxygen. So it's kind of resource consumptive. So what your brain does is every day when it kicks out the small number of neurons in comparison to like when you take this stuff, it kicks out of a much larger number of neurons. It still goes through this process called the synaptic pruning and just goes in and goes whack and kills them because it doesn't want to lose the energy because it doesn't need to. So what I always tell people is the cool part is around week three, if you put your brain under cognitive load and you try and learn something entirely new, not something where it's an already prescribed pathway neurally, but something totally new, like if you don't do it juggling or dual in back training or another language or a different instrument or sprinting or you know something that's going to put you under some sort of cognitive load where you're doing something that you've never done before, the neurons actually cement in place. And the cool part about that is you literally end up with a better brain. I mean, you actually have more hmm. capacity at the end of that and that takes about three weeks to start to hit that process of getting yeah. rid of the junk out of the brain upregulating the energy and the the neurogenesis yeah that's where so you get the short-term boost and everybody gets that but really the the magic happens at about the three-week mark if you're willing to put in the work right so like i'm providing a tool but it's not you know, a hammer sitting on the ground doesn't do a damn thing if you don't actually pick it up to drive the nails in. So this is a good tool and there's some benefit from it. But if you actually utilize it and put in the work yourself, oh my God, it's remarkable. You know, I mean, that's, you know, having a lot of new neurons at your disposal and, and just a tremendously enhanced synaptic capacity, like where you're able to process things you weren't before. It's great. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's the perfect thing, but you, you do have to put in the work. Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll pick up some more. And for anybody listening, it's wizardsciences.com, right? Yep, that's it. I'm also taking the Olympic RX. And then there were three others that were sent to me. I know one's for pets, but is there an advantage to taking the f other four at the same time? I am taking the two at the same time, but... No, there's really not. So if people have just baseline cognition issues and they're really dinged up, I tell them to take the C60 first, just the Evolve, which is just kind of a a C60 product that's extra virgin olive oil bound to a C60 molecule. And then I also tell them to take the C8, which is elixir is what we call it. And the, the rationale behind those, and that's just an organic coconut oil bound to a C60 molecule. The rationale is you want, before you start adding a lot of energy into the system, you want to drop out the neural inflammatory response in your brain and the inflammatory response through most of your cells. So you're just okay. kind of trying to go, go for a sort of think of it like a cleaning round of cytokine suppression systemically. You're just trying to get everything kind of simmered down now. And then, then you start putting the real heavy duty stuff in and upregulating it. So there's no need to take both of those at the same time. I notice you're avoiding the word detox. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of those things really do trigger detox one of my fave things is that because carbon like activated charcoal you know it's carbon as well they they're great for detoxing but i always tell people like if you do this it will trigger a detox like if you go straight to neural or olympic yeah it definitively triggers a detox i always tell people just take a binder with it you know like quicksilver has a really good binder there are lots of companies that have good binders you can even just suck down some activated charcoal and kind of kind of go through that there i've talked to a lot of people over the past couple of years that had a pretty intense detox reaction but that's good you know you just kind of have to motor through it it might take a couple of weeks to get that but that's because unfortunately we don't live in new zealand you know we uh we live in an environment where there's you know not to say that they're they're sharing a different atmosphere or different water but their their environment seems relatively pristine in comparison to you know most of the cities around here and i think our bodies are responding to that you know we're constantly bathed in an emf soup at the same time we're being blasted with chemicals in the air it's not 
it's not so conducive to great overall biological health. And, and so you just, I mean, except the fact that we all have toxins in our system, it is what it is. We just deal with it, you know, and we move through it. So do you think you can, despite those shortcomings of our environment, still improve? Obviously, you can improve longevity to a degree because if you're adding in the good stuff. But is there a point that you're seeing that's like, hey, we got to start removing that stuff? Or can you just keep on like adding in all these crazy wizard products and uh, improving longevity? Yes and no. Can you? Sure. Should you? No. At least that's my opinion. You know, you can... You can constantly avoid the root of the issue and just kind of, I mean, heck, Western medicine in great part. (laughs) That's the definition. (laughs) We're not going to pay attention to what's really going on here, but we are going to sell you something that makes you not notice it. That should be their slogan. (laughs) (laughs) Don't worry about problems. Just put your head in the sand. Yeah, it's it's not the best approach. So can can we keep doing things? Yeah, I'm I'm sure there are a lot of bright guys in the world. I'm sure, you know, I could probably figure out some stuff to to keep adding things on in a beneficial way. But I'm not going to because I don't think that's I don't think that's healthy long term. You know, part of kind of the incumbent responsibility when you can think clearly is, you go, okay, is this really helping or is this really hindering? And if you're if you're constantly coming up with technological problems or technological fixes rather that just allow people to be idiots and jerky, that's not so good. You know, I think actually it's better if you can kind of help put people and things in a framework where they realize kind of the the connectivity to all of the other things. So yeah, I'm I mean, could we make things that help consistently? Sure. But I think the real root of the issue environmentally and the stuff that's kind of assailing our body, yeah, we need to reduce pollution. We need to make things more healthy. You know, one of the companies I work with is this company called Redbud Brands. And I love their approach because they do consumer packaged goods and they try and make, you know, products that people are familiar with, but just simply better. So it's healthy and it's genius. You know, I mean, it's it's such a simple thing. But, you know, like skinny pop popcorn, right? Like you you just take things that people are are used to and you tweak it just a little bit. You don't have to go for 150% gain. You just go for a 10% bump, right? Like if you, and in fact, to be honest, when you crack some of these puzzles and you come up with something that is remarkably different and really could could have the capacity to be world-changing and beneficial, a lot of times people, one, don't believe it, or two, the incumbents just basically make it their life's mission to kind of crush that idea because it supplants them technologically and more important monetarily and you know big companies don't want to lose their revenue streams i mean that that's really kind of been the the driver in a lot of these things so if you can if you can kind of work around that and create better products that are marginally better as opposed to revolutionary i actually think you get a better adoption which is as i said why i kind of admire what those guys are doing is because they're taking things and making them better across the board, but they're not making them so different that people aren't doing it. You know? uh, that's it. Yeah, that's a really interesting thought process to go down because like this guy that I was just telling you about, Mate- uh, Panis, that's doing the metabolomics testing. It's like, you know, I can I, I, I don't understand the ins and outs of it, but I get the basic idea. Like we're going to have better diagnostics. It can mm-hmm. be done with a finger prick at home. It's more accurate and we cover pretty much everything. Right. And so th- that would change a lot about diagnostics potentially or could improve a lot of what we have. But how do you work around that then not upsetting the incumbents and still progressing humanity? Because I would think that. And then how do they squash it too would be kind of a secondary follow-up question to that. Well, I don't I don't know that I have really done anything that's of such great note that it's actually progressing humanity other than just being nice. Uh, that's, you know, kind of, if I have one claim to fame of things that I know that have really impacted the world, it's probably just being kind. Because other than that, I don't know that anything I've done is, has reached such wide-scale adoption that it's made much of a dent. Hopefully over time they will. Let's see, I... I would think that my dad and I had a conversation about this probably 12 years ago. And I I remember exactly where I was. I was in Houston driving on the highway and I called him and I said, Hey pop, let's suppose you had three ideas that were world changing, right? Like you could develop and you knew you could develop three technologies that were world changing. How would you get that out to people? And and he laughed and said, well, Rube, if, 
if your last name isn't Tesla, that's probably not happening. <laughs> so, and, you know, which, you know. So then you that, legally change your name to Tesla, right? So, yes, I changed my last name to Tesla. Uh, yeah. so, no, but, but he was right, though. I mean, it, it is, yeah. I, I've been kind of lucky in that I've actually hit some good strokes on things in, in different fields. But generally speaking, you didn't, you know, with the way things go nowadays, there's so much specialization and not many generalists that things are very confined. Like one person isn't going to hit it across a whole lot of fields usually. That is that is actually probably why I get zinged with the moniker of polymath is because I've been able to make some strides across very disparate fields that that are markedly improved in comparison to the things that were kind of the, the incumbent constructs. But what he said was, well, I suppose if you're really seriously going to try and do that, you'd have to do it over time so that you don't rock the boat. Because if you rock the boat, you're going to get squished. And I, I know definitively we've seen that, right? You know, like with Tesla even, right? Wardenclyffe Tower. They've just, there was a group of physicists and an engineer, I think last year that tested Tesla stuff and showed, hey, turns out he was right. You really could wirelessly transmit electricity to all of these different vehicles. And they actually did a mock-up and, and uh, showed that it worked. And so why did that go away? Well, money. You know, because there wasn't a way to, you know, J.P. Morgan didn't didn't have a way to meter it. So if you're streaming free energy, Tesla wanted to be free because he saw that it would impact humanity in a positive way. I think, unfortunately, a lot of times people in, in order to be tapped into some of this stuff and actually get access to the things that are going to be really beneficial, you have to really approach it from kind of an altruistic standpoint or a, l- a little bit of a of a kumbaya approach, because I, I noticed that yeah. you know, I was joking about my approach being a little too Pollyanna and, and for better or worse. Yeah, maybe it is, but that really is how I view things is like, I want to help. Right. I, you know, I feel like I've been given some gifts and what do you do with those? Well, you help. Why? Because everybody's connected. You know, I, at the end of the day, the things that are the most important to me are the, the people, right? Like all the people I love. that's, you know, there aren't many people at the very last second of their life who are going, ah, you know, I wanted lunch more. I wanted more money. It's they think about all the people that they love. And sometimes I think in order to, to receive a lot of the information and to be tapped in, you have to approach it that way. Like I've, I've had some things recently for we've been working on a desalination thing. And I will definitively say the knowledge was just dropped in my lap. And quite literally, I mean, we tested it, it works, but it was literally just dropped in. It's not something I've you know, I've spent, you know, countless hours of arduous research and work on, I I asked the question, and I was kind of gifted with the answer. And you could say that's, you know, kind of subconscious mind processing thing after decades of research and all that. And I'm sure to a certain extent, just to have the vocabulary to be able to do that, there is a component of that. But, you know, Tesla had a, a really beautiful approach in terms of how he was trying to help humanity. I'm just kind of doing the same thing. And and I think that's why I, I do actually get access to a lot of concepts and constructs and ideas that I can use. But I'm using him as an example because, you know, he was kind of hammered uh, for doing that and shunned socially. And I don't want to get them the same berry path because if you make too much of a ripple, the incumbent players will just crush you. And that's just, it's good finances, right? You know, I mean, they're I don't think they're malevolent in, in an individual basis. I think it's the aggregate of those actions that we see that appear malevolent. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's not like they're bad people. It's like these guys want to provide for their families too. They do it by going to a job. And, you know, do they really want that job to disappear because somebody is saying, hey, this is better for the other people in the world? Well, they're not really concerned about the other people in the world, they're concerned about the people that they love. Right. That's and I mean, I think that honestly, that kind of applies to all of us is our our focus is really in general. It, it's on the people that we're closest to our our sphere of influence. We pretty much do just about anything for those. You know, I have kids, you have kids, you know, for your four kids, you'd probably do just about whatever it took to make sure that they were safe and taken care of. And I think the same thing applies across the board. So, you know, to your point about how do you get around that? I think education, right? That's that's actually one of the reasons I like making the world smarter, you know, kind of doing nootropics and trying to do things like that is if people start to realize that there is a continuity in a community that's bigger than what they see, right? That you're connected to things on the other side of the planet 
in a in a very literal sense just as much as you're connected to the things that you're next to and the people also it it changes your approach like for me that's a very a very tangible thing and i mean i it's probably a little bit more more obvious to me because of some of the things that I've been ex- exposed to, and and now, frankly, some of the things that I can do that are not terribly normal. I mean, we've we, we've done that kind of offline. When you realize that everything is connected, it, it really doesn't feel like you're you're making some big effort to change the world or do something for somebody you've never met. You you really realize like, wow, we're all connected. You know, a rising tide raises all ships. I, if I can help everybody, I'll do that. And I think that the education process is really the only way to get around the, the incumbents trying to crush you. And there are plenty of ways they can do that. I mean, you can be discredited professionally, discredited socially. It's, you know, I mean, God, with deep fake technology, that's, it's about the easiest thing in the universe to do now, you know, and it's only going to get better or worse, depending on, on the framework. Of <laughs> on which side you're on <laughs> or perspective. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that's that's the thing. I, I think really those guys, there are tons of ways you can get, get shot out of the saddle, but the way around that is to just try and have an open discourse and and try not to change too much. You know, revolutionary change generally fails. Evolutionary change generally works. And the difference is, you know, one is very rapid and, and brutal usually, and the other is kind of progressive. And and I mean there are there are periods of, you know, like punctuated equilibrium i'm sure like if anybody's listening to this who who is kind of in the evolution versus revolution thing that's going to be the first thing that says you know what about punctuated equilibrium which is just where things jump more steps than they should in a given progression but that too is kind of a sort of i don't know i'd say it's kind of like the divine spark of evolution you know things things are being nudged forward in a way that is different like our our perception and this seems a little esoteric but that I'll just I'll go ahead and go there. Our perception <laughs> Do it. Thing is that we're pushing things forward, and I think that's an just a, a tremendously hubristic fallacy, right? Like we think we're pushing things forward because the locus of our intent and our brain and everything is here in our body, and so we're going out and doing all these things, and we think we're pushing the culture forward. I think that's total BS. I think actually what's happening is we're being drawn into the future because of the inherent potential that we have as a species and just like things in nature you know the wind doesn't blow the wind is pulled past you it's moving Mm -hmm. into a low pressure center and you know one of the fellows that i I work with that i really love we were talking one day and he had some concerns about kind of his own evolution as a as a person i said listen you got a great heart i you know i i think just keep doing what you're doing right like no No acorn had to go to oak tree school. They don't stress out about what they're going to become. The inherent potential that you're going to express over the course of your lifetime is intrinsic to you. It's already there. You spend the next 80 years bringing that forward, but the potential was already there. You don't have to have a course on how to do it. It's just going to happen. And likewise, as a species, I really do feel that we're being pulled into the future, This, which is the reason I think so frequently that more than one person will have the same idea at the same time. You know, like E equals MC squared. Didn't just happen with Einstein. There was another fellow at the same time who had the same thought and kind of, ah, why? Not because Einstein was pushing things into the future, but because we were being pulled as a species. And it was time that that idea was manifest. And so that idea cropped up to two people in different places at, at the same time. And that happens. I mean, if you really look at the history of technological evolution, that sort of stuff happens all the time, you know? And do you take that to such an end to say that there's not free will or would you say there's still free will within that context? No, I would say there's definitively free will. I, I'd say on average, you know, there's there's probably less free will than there is more things that are programmatic. And this is kind of like, you know, when people play a video game, they always think like, oh, you know, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. What they neglect to realize is they did that within a framework that was already provided for them by the programmers that allowed them to have the obviousness of choice. But truly, those choices were all directed across a prescribed path. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, the universe is not an idiotic sort of place. God is not a fool, you know, I mean, depending on what you kind of subscribe to and believe, I think whatever the overarching intelligence is in the world. Uh, and the whole universe 
it, it's not going to give toddlers pistols, you know, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> you know, have so much free will that we're going to be able to totally botch it. Everything would probably, it's just like we would do with little kids, right? You, you want your kids to go outside and play, but you don't want your kids to book a trip to Tahiti without you, right? Like there's, we, we have boundaries and kind of like, you're four. I don't think you can go to Tahiti by yourself today, right? Play in the front yard, play within the fence. We, we set up as parents, we set up confines. And I think kind of generally speaking, the microcosm and the macrocosm are sort of related, right? And you, you can see patterns repetitively, like social structures are very similar to cellular structures, but kind of the hierarchical nature and distribution curves that you see in plants, you see in animals, right? You know, trees have a bartering system. There's, there's literally an entire economic system that's set up for sugars and through different networks of trees. It's it's remarkable. They have preferential rates. <laughs> you just say stuff that is so crazy for me. Well, like I've never it's, thought it's, about it's trees a having people. a bar. It's yeah. a good thing, not bad crazy, amazing crazy. But well, it's based on a lot of research that was done on uh, glycolysis and 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 plants. And and when they looked at the the networks and the groupings, not shockingly. Plants were preferential to plants of the same genus and species. And, you know, so there, it's, it's an economic system. And, I, and the thing that comes to mind is it's hard to escape what you really are in nature, right? So we're a system that cascades up. This is like a lot of the quantum biological things I do. Y you, you're changing things on a physical level by acting on a non-physical function. And, yeah. <laughs> you know, you and I have talked about that. And maybe we have to do a, a part two at some point. Um, oh, hundred percent. But uh, in in fact, I I have to go because we've got a quantum biology experiment set up with myself at the university here with a, a biochem professor and a group in Germany, and we're doing these changes that we're very demonstrably showing we're able to make changes through non physical means, you know, separated by ten thousand miles, which is which is remarkable to me. Still, don't really yeah. understand the mechanism. We'll get there, but right now, the repeatability of the weird data sets that come out of this are enough to make me like a giddy schoolgirl. I'm like, Whoa! you know, it's 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 like it's such crazy cool stuff. And and actually, the coolest part is we don't exactly know how it's working yet, you know, which is great because that's like that's like where the real science, you know, the rubber meets the road. And the real science it's right outside of what you can look up in a book. You can't look up the answers, right? Nobody knows yeah. them yet. So we, we get the benefit of trying to move things forward. Well, and you've brought a lot of, uh, I mean, in the last month, I've been really excited about the stuff that you've been teaching me on the quantum biology and going into that a little bit. And like, I, I don't really know much, but the, the thing that it's done for me is it's like really opened up my mind. And when you say things like trees have bartering systems, it really just, I find it so exciting because there's so much about the world that I have no clue about. And so to be in a state of like awe and acceptance of just what it has to offer is really exciting. And, yeah, uh, well, I'm in the same space, man. There's so much more that I, I don't know and I don't understand. And I, you know, it's like you, you find a string and you pull the thread a little bit and you're like, wow, well, it's going in a totally different direction. I think you have to be sort of agnostic right? You, you, you don't really want to have some preconceived notion about where things are going. You just have to be totally open to like, it, honest science is basically where you don't have a preconceived notion. You might have a hypothesis that you're running with, but if the data takes you in an entirely different direction, so be it. You follow the data. You know, that's, that's being honest and open and really doing good science. And that's one of the things I love is so much of this stuff with the quantum biology, we have no clue, right? It's, we're, we're seeing effects that are just well, that shouldn't happen, you know, with everything that we've been taught and everything that we've kind of put together, we have this very mechanistic idea of how the world functions. And I, I'd say something I said recently to a friend of mine is really, it's, it's turning out, at least in the data, that we are very much more a thought than a thing. You know, the impacts of the vibrations that are propagated, you know, whether you think of every time you have a thought, there is an electrochemical impulse and that propagates a wave electromagnetically that literally carries on pretty much throughout the universe forever. Well, that's like consciousness, basically. Yeah, right? It's an interaction, right? It is consciousness. And so that has a tangible effect, you know, and, and we're, we're seeing that right now. It's that you can actually affect a change in something just by virtue of the way you focus on it. 
I, I mean, we've done the double slit experiment before, and you know, like that, that's that kind of stuff has been known for quite a while that you can collapse a waveform just by observation and take it from a wave to a particle. But to really see it in play in biological systems separated by thousands of miles is still just, it kind of makes me giddy because it's, it's remarkable. Like, who knew? You know, I'm sure somebody did, but damn sure not me. Yeah. No. Very cool. So, it, like, when you're pushing the envelope with all these things, you kind of touched on, you know, the incumbents. But there's also not levels of importance, but levels beneath that in terms of, like, well, there's people that just, it's really hard to wrap your mind around. And it's so different from things that I understand or the way that I perceive the world, the way that I perceive myself, that it violates so much of that, that I write it off as, and I'm not saying I do, but at times in my life, and there's probably a lot of things I do this with, but I write it off as, you know, that's not true, or like, that isn't valid for X, Y, or Z reason. Like some of the stuff that you showed me, like, 10 years ago, if you showed me that, and I've been like, the closest thing I could have correlated that to was like witchcraft. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> I have no idea how to explain this, <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, that's hilarious. But, right? Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. but, but there's, I mean, you're, you're, you're showing me things that are, are just so against what I understand, but that's why it's exciting too. Well, how cool. do you, how do you draw people and to be more open-minded and really unbiasedly looking at these things? Love. In a word, <laughs> literally, love. You kind of, I think when people realize that you actually care about them and that you're not out for any other interest other than just to help, it's, it's, not, it's not that hard, right? But that's, that's, you know, kindness is a very cheap thing to, to propagate a really impactful sort of wave. Right. If it, if as the data is starting to show, everything really has to do with how you observe things and how you look at things, look at things kindly. I mean, it again, it sounds really Pollyanna, but the impact is really profound. You can do things that most people would consider physically impossible if you're just capable of harnessing those sorts of emotions and pointing them in a specific direction. I mean, we've We've done that, that experiment that you and I did offline that, you know, that's all that really is, is you're taking, you're taking a function that is normally just people think of like, oh, I feel, I feel love towards this or that. Well, right. But maybe it's more than that. Maybe at a, at a core level, we really are built on a substrate that is in fact that thing. And if that's the case, the more refined you can make those feelings and the more kindness you can show towards pretty much everything the the more your capacity and power gets tapped in so that you can direct those in positive ways. And that's been my experience, you know, with consistently being able to to do things. And and perhaps I'm a little brazen about it because I I'm able to do it every time, all the time, over and over. So I'll do some, you know, kind of experiments that are different that as you said, some people would say like, ah, shocking, witchcraft, this or that. No, nah, it's really not. You know, you can call it quantum biology because, you know, science is sort of the religion of the day or a thousand years ago, you could have called it a miracle or, you know, whatever. And all, all those things, it's it's just different cultural frameworks placed around the same constructs that I think personally humanity has always had the capacity for. You just see it in little kind of blurbs where it pops up here and there. You know, I I'm glad I don't live, you know, in Salem in the 1600s. I probably would have had a really bad week. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, that's that's I think one thing you do wonderfully at is using language and, and why the product that we're working on it's like, hey, let's bring it up here. But we're using like common ground, right? But those types of things are much more of a common ground because it isn't this politicized word, and so people are generally more open and accepting to it. So when you say like quantum biology or subatomic biology, even to go into more common ground. I think it does yeah. a wonderful job at bridging some, some gaps there. Well, I think if, if you, again, if you go from zero to a hundred, sometimes it's hard to hang on. If you go from zero to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, you can, you can get, you can get people to understand the concept. I was having a, a conversation at a conference with a, uh, a biologist who's a friend of mine and Greg Fay, he's probably the best cryobiologist in the world, in my opinion. And he developed a technology to take organs and be able to freeze them, right? Because the big problem with like 
organ transplants isn't that we don't have enough. We actually have more than we need to, to handle everybody who's been in an accident or needs a transplant. The problem is we can't get it to them, right? Because they they die. And and Greg developed a, a way to actually freeze organs and thaw them and, and make them useful, which is brilliant. And But we were talking about the concept of quantum biology and, and the transfer of information as being the thing that's actually important, not so much the physicality. And it was, we have a, a great care and respect for one another, I think at a, at a core level. So we can get in a very heated intellectual debate about what is and is not happening mechanistically. And we did, but at the end of the day, I think the only way I was able to get, not that I you know, convinced him of anything because that's not really my job, but um, the only way I was able to kind of demonstrate the, the premise of what I was working on was not to go, well, it does this and just jump to the end point. It was to go, we've seen this in this field. We've seen this in this field. We've seen this and to lay out all of the breadcrumbs so you can say, okay, this concept seems completely ridiculous to me. Like you can affect the change in ATP levels by thinking something 10,000 miles away or focusing on something or putting something in a, in a different type of device with no physical interaction. Well, yeah. We can, but a hundred years ago, the idea that you and I would be in different parts of the country having a conversation in real time with imagery, and I would be able to pick up your emotional affectations and all that sort of stuff, that would have been preposterous. In fact, Tesla actually said that at the one of the IEEE conventions, and he was lambasted as just being. A <laughs> and you know, so the, the same sort of sort of thing applies. You, you can't take things so full. You have to provide demonstrable examples and say, okay, we can transmit this to this. We know how Wi-Fi works. We know how biology works. We know how quorum signaling works. And you, 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 you take constructs that people are familiar with and you weave it so that you can kind of leave the breadcrumbs to pull things from one to the other to the other. And I, I think that's kind of, uh, if anything, that's really what I try and do is just help, help out by providing a little little bitty beacons along the way so that people can see these things so yeah i think that's a wonderful way to verbalize it just leaving that breadcrumb trail and kind of constructing a narrative with stuff that they're familiar with already so that you can build a foundation on that but i know you got to go so if people I, want to find information or learn more about what you do you got wizard sciences you got a bunch of other stuff that you do where should people go to find that stuff just they can go to the wizard sciences.com site or they can go to instagram and and look at wizard sciences i i am horrible about posting things i think i've got six posts on instagram in the entirety of my career as uh, is someone on that platform. So I don't really do much, but if people need anything, I always say that, you know, reach out to me. And, and this is true, you know, reach out to me. It's my Instagram is at Ian Mitchell one. And it may take me a while because my inbox gets quite filled up with DMs there, but I will get back to every single person. So it might just take a bit. So be patient. That's amazing. That's amazing that you do that. Yeah, that's great. And and you have interviews too, just online. So Ian Mitchell, yeah. just yeah, YouTube you know, just, or... Spotify, yeah. all that good stuff. Yep. Yeah, the normal socials. Yeah, yeah. Well, cool, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm sure we'll do some more podcasts or talking. I know you're super busy too, so that it's more dependent on your schedule than mine. But I'd love to do more if if you have the chance. So, but yeah, thanks again. All right, my pleasure. Have a great one. See ya. You too.